Hello and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. Today I want to talk about the process of reviewing, the job I do here, trying to bring you the information on products that you've probably seen, you may be thinking of buying, and you want to know, is it worth the money? Should I spend my money or buy something else? And I have to say that it's a very fine line I have to walk when, walk when I'm reviewing these products because there are people out there you just can't please. For example, yesterday I posted a video showing how easily the ZMR250 Chinese mini quad frame broke in a relatively low energy impact on soft soil. I mean, I've crashed my blackout and some of the other quads here at far more vigorously, you know, really massive crashes and they haven't broken. The ZMR broke, so I wanted to find out why and I had a look and there's definitely a design flaw in those arms, which is why they broke so easily. Now I figured there are people out there who are probably looking to buy mini quads now. They may have seen the review of the ZMR 250, the first part I did. They may be thinking, well, yeah, I can live with those you know, um, occasionally badly formed holes and you know, the other minor downsides of that frame because it's so damn cheap. And, but they may think that, um, you know, buy the frame. However, if they bought the frame and they flew it and they had a little bang and the arms broke, they'd probably come back at me and say, oh, why didn't you tell us about that? So I'm telling you about it. Of course, then we get the people who see that and go, oh, you're just knocking those Chinese frames. They're bloody good. You got those free machines from Luminaire and um, Blackout and um, X Hover. So naturally, you're just going to knock the, the cheap Chinese ones. Well, it's not true, folks. I'm sorry. It's not true. Uh, when there's a definite problem with the product, I'll tell you about it. It's my, part of my job. And it doesn't matter to me whether I got a product for free, whether I had to spend my own money on it, whether it came from China, whether it came from Germany, the USA, whatever. I treat all these products as, as equal until I've evaluated them. Now, you've seen I've reviewed some Chinese products which I said were crap. The Dominica, Dominica camera. Dominica sent me one to review. I reviewed it. It was pretty bad. The focus was all out and it was, as value for money, it was pretty crap. I got it for free. Didn't influence my review because I didn't think it was a good product and I told you. I've got other products that I bought with my own hard earned money which I think are damn brilliant. Some of them are Chinese made. The AXN Clouds Fly Floater Jet. It's a brilliant model, it's fantastic. Everyone who flies model aircraft should have an AXN and it's Chinese and I reckon it's really great. The Free Sky Radio Gear. I was one of the first people in the world to review that radio gear. I was very impressed by it. I told everybody and now FreeSky is a major force in radio control modules, transmitters, receivers and increasingly servos and so forth. Um, it's Chinese and I promoted it and said it's brilliant because I found it was a really good product. So I'm just bringing you the facts. Now some people may not like the facts, they may not, may not like the fact that a $30 Chinese multi-rotor frame is not as good as a $150 US or Australian one. But it's a fact, it's true. No one can deny that the Chinese um, ZMR250 frame is not as good as the far more expensive alternatives. I'm going to show you in a minute exactly why that's, those arms are breaking, what's wrong with them, and hopefully you'll see for yourself. Now I'm not saying the ZMR is inferior because it's Chinese and I got the other stuff for free. No, I'm saying it's inferior because it has some problems. Hopefully the people who designed that frame will look at that and go, we can fix that by making a small change to the geometry of our arms and then it won't be a problem. But if I didn't tell people, no one would know, and I'd get a whole lot of people bitching at me saying, I bought one of those frames after your review, and all I did was fall onto the ground from 20 feet, and the motor fell off, broke the arm. So I bring you the information. You've got to make the choices. All I can do is inform you as objectively as possible of the things I find. And in the case of the ZMR frame, I found a problem. Now, the other problem is, of course, that when I do review a Chinese product positively and I find a really good product and I tell you about it, then other people come out of the woodwork and say, oh, you're just, you're just a, uh, an agent for Hobby King, you're just promoting Hobby King stuff, they must pay you, you know, to give it such good reviews. Well, <laughs> rock in a hard place, folks. Either I'm anti-Chinese or I'm basically a covert marketer for Chinese products. I can't be both. <laughs> and the reality is I'm neither. I'm neither. I'm just an objective reviewer who likes to bring my experience, my knowledge, my skill to bear on the products that come before me and I try to tell you what I found. So you can make those decisions for yourself. And remember, do not, do not confuse quality with value because they're two totally separate things. Now I've said this Chinese frame isn't the same quality as the Blackout or the MXP230 or the um, Luminaire QAV250 and it's not. But what about value? And I haven't got to value yet. That's in the final part of the review and when I do my shootout, I'm going to tell you which represents the best value because that's the thing most people buy. We'd all love to buy a Rolls-Royce or a Ferrari or a Bugatti, but few of us can afford them. So we look for the best value 
in a car and quite often it's a Toyota Corolla or the Honda Civic or something because it's not the cheapest but it's the best compromise between mon spending money and getting the results you want. So there's there's the cost versus the performance and that's a ratio that determines value and you know sometimes the most expensive things are not always the best things and likewise the cheapest things aren't always the worst things. This is the information I try to bring together deliver to you so as long as I'm getting as many complaints from people who say you're just a, a covert shill for Chinese products and Hobby King as long as I get the same number of those as the ones who, sta who stand up and say oh you're anti-Chinese <laughs> then I'm happy I'm, I'm displeasing both sides equally which means I must be fairly balanced. But let's move on to these arms, the arms on the ZMR250. Let's take a scientific look at what the problem is. And to the whiteboard it is, and here we have a little bit of science for you today, a little bit of engineering science. Now, I'm not an engineer. I don't have any formal engineering qualifications. So I apologize to all the real engineers, as opposed to people like me that pretend to be one on the internet. I apologize for oversimplification and, you know, you'll probably spot flaws, spot flaws in what I'm doing here. But nevertheless, I just want to get the basic concepts across to people watching. Now, I want to talk about stress concentration and uh, that's something that has to be taken into account when you're designing pieces of a craft that are going to have to endure loads and sometimes very, very high loading as you get in a mini quad when you crash the damn thing. Now, the stress concentration is defined by this formula. I'm not going to go into the details and explain it to you because we'd be here for a long, long time and you really don't need to know. But suffice to say, that's the stress concentration, how you calculate that in any given area of a component. Uh, but I'm going to draw, well, I've drawn some diagrams here which show you things stress lines so you can see how the stress concentration works. I have here a, you know, thing could be a multi rotor arm. You can see it's got a narrow bit and a wide bit. And these green lines are the concentration of stress through this particular component. You'll notice that they tend to be relatively parallel. When we come to this area here where there's a change in dimension, they actually bottleneck a little bit. The reason for that is that. If you look at them coming this way, they don't take corners very well. So they overshoot a bit here and then they come back. So in this area here, if my pen will write, in that area there, we have a concentration, a buildup of stress. We have a stress riser, as it's called. And that means that well, if we look at these lines, what they mean is the closer together they are, the more stress there is on the material that we're depicting here. So when they get close enough together, the amount of stress exceeds the material's ability to withstand that stress and things break. They snap. So when these lines get close enough together, the material will break. And because they're closest together here, if it's going to break, that is where it'll break because that's where the stress is concentrated. All the lines come together. The same happens if you have a piece of stuff and you drill a hole in it. When you drill a hole in it, the lines are forced apart and therefore they become closer together here. So if you had a piece like this and you bent it, as you'd expect, it's probably going to break through here because that's where the lines of stress are most concentrated. That's a stress riser. The hole creates stress risers on either side. That's what we're dealing with with these multi-rotor arms. So where we have any change in geometry, as it's called, I don't know if this pen actually writes. Here's one that will. I'll write this down. Uh, stress risers are caused by a change in geometry which basically just means a change in shape. Whenever you have changed the width or the thickness of an object, then stress will be concentrated in that area. It's important to know that. So the design, even the shape of these things is really, really important. You know, if you were going to design for the minimum or the, the maximum strength, ideally you should use nice gentle curves because stress rises tend to occur where there are small radius changes as well. So if we have something that is, like, let me draw something like this. And something that's like this, the one with the sharp edges will create much greater stress riser in that critical area here than you get in there. Because as I say, the stress lines don't corner very well. They tend to overshoot a bit. Here, the corners are gentle, so the stress lines will be, remain relatively smooth and they won't get bunched up so much, bunched up more. Because if we sort of look at this, let me sort of try and draw a thing here. Um, here, the stress lines are this far apart. And here, even though we've got the same width of material, they're actually closer together because of the effect of these sharp, small radius bends here, forcing the lines to overshoot. I mean, as I say, you engineers watching, stop cringing because I'm trying to draw. Make it simple for folks that haven't done the engineering work. But suffice to say, if we want to make it strong, we want smooth curves, and we don't want too many of these holes. And we, we want to make sure that all the changes in geometry 
are gentle and subtle, not sudden and you know, right angled or sharp. So those are the things that um, create stress concentration. And ultimately, of course, the other factor is how much material is left after you've drilled your holes and things. How much actual material is there? What I'm going to do now is draw one of these arms as accurately as I can, but I'm really crap at this, so excuse me if I don't do a very good job. So here is these arms. They come out and come around and something like this. How close am I with this? Yeah, that's probably, that'll do. And you'll notice that there are some slots like this for the motor. And there's a big hole in the middle. Now, if we were to try and draw our stress lines in there, I wonder if this black pen will work, we would probably find that they go like this. As you'd expect, the edge ones will simply follow the edge, nothing much to see there. But the next lines in here, obviously, they're going to be really squeezed in to get around that hole. And squeezed in again there. And the same here. So as you can see, the, the, the stress rises caused by those holes are basically going to give us some danger points here and here, where the lines are really squished in together. And, you know, and because this is the area of minimum material as well. So when an arm like this it receives a very large amount of force applied to it, it's going to break where the stress rises, where those stress concentrations are most close or most densely packed. It's going to be just there and just there. And let's have a look at the arms that came off the ZMR250 and see exactly where they did break. This is the broken arm off the ZMR250 and if we take a close look at it, you can see that the area where it fractured is just here, exactly as the stress diagrams I draw on the board would probably indicate it would break because it's the area where the stress lines are concentrated because there's these holes here for mounting the motors. So the stress lines will be squeezed in around the edge there and so that's the point of higher stress. So just at the higher stress area the carbon has delaminated and the, the breakage has occurred. Just not enough material and too much of an impingement from these slots leaving only a tiny little gap along the edge here. So yeah, naturally it's going to break there. And if we compare that, as I say, with the, the blackout, you can see there's just so much more material here. So this is just not going to be as concentrated. The stress will be spread out over a wider area. So it'll take more force to cause the carbon to fail in these areas where the, there's a minimum, amount, a minimum amount of material. So yeah, it's just a, a better engineered solution. Whether it's by luck or by design, I don't know. But certainly this is a lot stronger obviously than this ever was and you know that's the the difference between the blackout and some other quads and the ZMR250. Um, suffice to say we're going to make some measurements of some of the dimensions now the width of the arm where the motor plate starts is about the same I'm just going to get my trusty calipers here and measure that on the blackout that is um, what's that that is 16.2 millimeters on the ZMR250 it is it's actually slightly wider on the ZMR250, it's 16, oh no, 16.3 millimetres. So it's not the fact that the arm is too narrow here. That's not the problem because the ZMR is actually a bit wider than the blackout. The real problem is these motor mounting slots. This is where the problem arises. Now on the ZMR250 arm, if I measure the minimum distance here, so this is the thickness of material that is left after the slot for the motor mount at this end. I find that, that is, let's measure that. That is uh, 4.8 millimetres. There's 4.8 millimetres of material along the side of that groove. And if we go inside here to the inside where the big hole is, we've got one point, just over 1.5 millimetres. So, OK, let's compare that to the blackout arm. On the edge of the blackout arm, we have, to try, measure it from the, from the smallest point. I don't want to be cheating. I'll measure it to the smallest gap there. And that is a total of six millimeters. So this is wider. It's wider than um, 4.8 I think it was to six millimeters. It's 1.2 millimeters wider here. It's more meat. And if we go from the inside slot here, eh, it's about the same one and a half millimeters. So but we've got an extra mill and a half or so on the edge each side. That's another three millimeters of carbon to break on an impact. So this arm will be stronger because if you imagine those lines of stress that we're talking about as they come down here and they're concentrated, the amount of gap there for the stress lines is much greater than the amount of gap there. So obviously the stress lines will be more concentrated through this area and therefore this will break with a lesser amount of force applied to the end of the arm. That's why this arm broke 
And that's why these ones, I've yet to break one, because they're just a better design. I mentioned in the original video that this motor plate is bigger too, which gives you more protection for your motors. Uh, it wasn't an issue in this case, but by making the plate bigger, they've allowed extra material here to make it stronger as well, and that's the key difference. That's why um, I believe the Blackout is a better frame, one of the reasons anyway, because it's just stronger. And no one can deny that this is a much stronger arm than that. I mean, you've seen the results, I've measured them. You can see just by looking that, you know, there's so much more meat there than there. And this is where the Blackout, the, the ZMR250 arm broke. So there you go, that's why the Blackout arm is stronger. Simple as that. And as I said, it's not about which craft has the best performance. It's not about which one has the highest price or lowest price. It's all about value, which is the best value for money. And that's going to be the subject of the big mini quad shootout, which will be coming up very soon after you see the second part of the ZMR 250 review and the full QAV 250 review, which will be coming up in a few days' time. So that's it. In the meantime, if you've got questions, comments, stick them on the bottom of the video, as you always do. I'll do my best to answer the questions and read the comments. And in the meantime, if you think I'm just knocking Chinese products, well, you know, that's fine. And if you think I'm just a shill for Chinese products, then that's fine too, because I'm not going to try and please everybody. Because I can't, I'm just going to do what I do. Tell you what's crap and what's not. And to do that, I've got to get back to the bench. See you later.